Uh, thank you to Conscience for inviting me to speak. And Donald, thank you very much. You are a hard act to follow. <laughs> okay. Um, I wish I had known you earlier. You would have certainly had a prominent place in my book. Um, and I think I'd like to say, what I'd like to say is thank you to everybody who's here. Uh, and just say who I am and why I wrote. I wrote my book, Conscientious Objectors of the Second World War, which was closely followed by Conscientious Objectors of the First World War. Why I had to write them back to front, as it were, chronologically out of order, only the publishers can tell me, and they didn't. Um, essentially, I am a non-fiction writer. It's been my day job for at least 40 years or more. Um, writing non-fiction books for children and for adults, virtually all of them commissioned. And as it turns out, I do specialise quite a lot in women's history, but it so turned out that I seem to write an awful lot about war. And what, in, what I noticed increasingly was that we write understandably, an awful lot about it, people's experiences during war, there is very little written about those who took a courageous stand, not, as the Peace Pledge Union would say, to swim with the tide, but for reasons of conscience, to refuse to kill, refuse to engage in the military process. And my parents, um, War, I think for somebody I was born in 46 and I think the Second World War dominated a lot of our lives for those of us who were born at about that time. I was fortunate, if you like, my parents, my father was a doctor who served in the RAMC, my mother was a nurse. So that actually they repaired bodies rather than destroyed them, if you like. But nevertheless, I did not grow up in a pacifist household like Donald, okay? And to a great extent, I sort of accepted the fact that there'd been six years of war and that given, and my heritage is Jewish, or at least on my father's side, given what I learned about war, I didn't really question its existence. I didn't know anything very much about pacifists, but I did know about Hiroshima. I did know about Nagasaki. And as I grew a bit older, I realised that I myself considered that war was not a justifiable method for resolving conflict. And I think I joined CND when I was about 15. I went on Audemarsson in 63, and the rest is history. Went to Greenham and have, in one way or another, I don't know that I would necessarily, I have to be honest, describe myself as pacifist. But even so, I'm, I'm never sure about that. But even so, so focusing it, I decided that really I would like to write about conscientious objectors. I knew quite a lot about First World, well, some about First World War conscientious objectors. Very little about people like Donald, who'd been conscientious objectors in the Second World War. And it was a fant I loved researching and writing this book. And I would also argue, I mean, those who oppose war are pretty invisible in military or non-military history. Every village, every town has a memorial to those, and rightly so, who died in war. Very few, there are very few memorials to those, apart from the stone in Tavistock Square, of course, to those who actually took the equally courageous stand more so of standing up for peace. And I thought, and if the, if conscientious objectors are invisible or have been, I would say that Second World War conscientious objectors are even more invisible than those of the First World War. I mean, that's not surprising. The First World War conscious people like Donald's father, who suffered appallingly, they were the trailblazers. They were the ones who established the right of conscientious objection. So that is the sort of background the, uh, to why I wrote these books. I was very keen to make my contribution as a writer to that history, if you like. 
Anyway, talking with Donald on Monday, uh, we decided that I would give, you know, it's very hard to follow Donald, but so what I'm going to do, what we agreed, I want to widen it a little bit, talk a bit about conscription and talk a little bit about what I encountered in my researches. Nothing beats personal testimony, but I'll just contribute, perhaps flesh out a bit more Donald's story. First of all, not everybody, you know, conscription was first introduced into Britain during the First World War. What had happened was by December 1915, British casualties numbered well over half a million. And Haig wanted another three million men, at least, to fling into the trenches, uh, into the killing fields. Up to that point, uh, the British Army had operated on a voluntary basis, which is the British tradition. We tend not. Other European countries, other countries have established national service and conscription. It wasn't seen as very British. But anyway, in January 1916, a military service bill which would, was introduced before the war, sorry, the war was underway, but initially that it was going to impose conscription on all men aged 18 to 41. There was a lot of opposition, a lot of opposition to it, but anyway, the bill passed and effectively it became an act. It was enacted on the 2nd of March, uh, 1916. And what was significant about it, and it's very different to the Second World War, was that Every eligible man, every, uh, at the, initially every unman, unmarried or widowed man who had no dependents aged 19 to 41 was, as of the 2nd of March 1916, and I quote, deemed to have enlisted for general service with the colours, i.e. on the 2nd of March 1916, all eligible men actually became, uh, they were conscripted straight into the army and that is actually quite significant i think because that's what conscientious objectors had to fight they were already within the military this did not happen in the second world war initially there were three grounds for exemption however and it's largely due to the work of the quakers as as donald had said but maybe unu unexpected at such a jingoistic period in the act there was what became known as the conscience clause okay and basically it meant there were other three other areas for exemption but under this one which is what we're interested in it meant that by law a man and it was men at that point could claim grounds could claim exemption on grounds of conscience so was born the conscientious objector the CO or the country as they became known. And I think it is quite important because, of course, until there's conscription, there is no conscientious objector. A conscientious objector is a legal status, if you like. It, clearly, if it's peacetime, you don't need to stand up as a conscientious objector. Anyway, conscription ended in 1919. 20 years later, when the war world hadn't got any wiser, uh, conscription was reintroduced in 1939 and initially it was reintroduced as the Military Training Act in May 1939. That is before war had broken out and that was Britain's first ever peacetime conscription. Young men aged 20 to 21 had to register at labour exchanges but actually and be available to be called up. That was the point. Um, as it happens, events escalated, and so it, on the 3rd of September 1939, the National Service Armed Services Act was introduced, which allowed for conscription of men aged 18 to 41. It was, init it was subsequently extended uh, in 1949 to men up to the age of 51. Okay, and so really differed. What was, what men had to do, and indeed women, which I'll mention later, was unlike um, the First World War, and as Donald has described, you registered. 
okay that was the process you weren't automatically in the army as happened in the first world war numbers okay during the first during the first world war around 16,000 men took their stand as conscientious objectors in fact the peace pledge union thinks it's much more than that due to the research they did in 2018 it's extensive research but that's the figure i i've got okay now during world war ii well over 62,000 men took the decision to register as co's and claim exemption from military service and a thousand women around a thousand women who from 1949 they weren't being conscripted into the army but from 1949 women were being conscripted into war work it was a form of conscription and a lot of women or a thousand of them stood up against it i mean it's a very small number compared with the numbers um who enlisted in the army nevertheless it's a significant number and it was three times the size of those of the first world war um donald has talked about you know who were they all i think donald who were these sixty-three thousand people if we include women i think donald would probably agree that there's no such thing as a typical conscientious objector from my research is the imperial museum imperial war museum if anybody is interested to pursue this they were sensible enough to record loads and loads they recorded people who'd experienced the first and second world wars the wonderful tapes but they include some terrific interviews with conscientious objectors they're all digitized and if anybody wants to hear the voices we've heard donald's i spent an awful lot of time with cans on my ears you know and they included all sorts of people they included actors they included lawyers they included clerks they included artists they included musicians um i was fortunate i traveled around quite a lot i interviewed in north wales a woman called evan we williams who was a member of the fellowship of reconciliation and who took a conscientious stand against being um, uh, conscri conscripted into a particular war work. Uh, her friends and family were extremely unhappy about this and she felt when she went to register she was very aware of the looks of distaste on the people in the, in the labor exchange which is where people went to register in their areas she was very aware in fact the impression i got from women i spoke to was that they actually received more hostility than some of the men it clearly seemed to shock them i also was fortunate i have three friends whose fathers were all conscientious objectors living locally um, my friend lorna's father was a man called fred vahi um who was a very interesting man he built uh his family's home out in pet level and there were a lot of conscientious objectors in sussex i believe some military person from the first world war bought them some land and fred was always scathing about the fact that ceos didn't need, seem to know how to work the land at all he was, but he could be very scathing um and i also interviewed a man called eric farley who spent three months in wandsworth he was an absolutist uh, and a man called brian phillips who was very well known he was a quaker his daughter sally phillips locally is a very is quite a well-known quaker um uh, and so there were many 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 different types um reasons also varied as far as i could see people i spoke to obviously Donald's many conscientious objectors took their stand for reasons of faith or religion but not all some were socialists who took a class line these were imperialist wars so, tribunals were never as kind to political um, objectors they felt I think they found political objection harder to comprehend um, and they were not prepared to fire on their colleagues their class brothers and their sisters um fred varhi 
took his stand, his, his brother went off to war, Fred didn't, but as a child, and he wrote in his diaries when he was small, he was haunted by the pictures, the images of um, men who seemed to be disabled, wearing strange pyjamas and being very, very depressed. Later, Fred learnt that these were men who'd survived, come back from the World War, the First World War, shell-shocked. And as a child, when he was told this, he questioned what might happen, you know, what sort of unacceptable thing would take place to turn people into these wrecks. And he writes about it in his diaries. Um, as, you know, Donald has indicated, uh, men and women came from different um, places. Uh, they had different reasons. They were also they were they where they drew their line conscience i think donald would agree is very personal um some were prepared willing even to do alternative service provided it had some humanitarian basis others were not prepared to compromise in any way some did not turn up for their tribunals they did not recognize the system okay um so there were sort of absolutists um like Fred, for example, who wasn't prepared, he walked into his tribunal, lost his temper, walked out again, and actually because he was a rather scary man, he was sort of left alone. Though the police were constant, did, and the Home Guard constantly came to the house because they decided that Fred and his wife might be German spies, and all their mail was opened and all sorts of things, but he was left alone. Many had been involved in the Peace Pledge Union, I don't know if Donald was, Quite a few had taken, many I spoke to, I spent a lot of time talking to, in the Peace Pledge Union and with the archives there, and many had taken Dick Shepherd's Peace Pledge. Though, as um, a conscientious and absolutist called David Spreckley said, many of those who took the pledge did not stand as conscientious objectors afterwards, and many of those who were conscientious objectors were not necessarily members of the Peace Pledge Union. The Peace Pledge Union and um, the organisation that somebody called Dennis Hayes belonged to did provide a lot of support. Um, I mean, Donald has talked about, uh, I have figures here which I told Donald I would mention, which I will do, I'm noticing the time. Um, as Donald rightly said, conscientious object would be conscientious objectors went to the same registration offices in the labour exchange that those registering for military service went to. Some of them found it very daunting. There would be a separate space where, as one person I spoke to, he described himself as he rather forlornly went off to this table while all his mates, he was a bit worried because he'd been at school with some of these boys and he was heading off to one table next to the girls toilets i think or the girls entrance um and having registered those who wanted to be a conscientious objector were put onto a provisional list and as donald points out they had to write a personal statement and appear in front of a tribunal which effectively tested their sincerity i would question um i would question um whether it is possible to test since how do you test many conscientious objectors say how on earth do you test sincerity the military act doesn't define conscience either uh, as donald said tribunals had four options and the figures i have which come from dennis hayes who was part of the central bureau for conscientious objectors i think or central council um there were very very few who received unconditional exemption, 4.7% of the total. Conditional exemption, that is conditional on doing alternative service under civilian control. By far the largest, like Donald, got conditional exemption, and that was 37.9. Those who were sent into the military for non-competent duties, 27.7% and those who removed from the CO register altogether 
percent straight into your army it's quite large 29.7 percent okay i'm going to give the percentages i mean there's lots and there's so much this is such a big story one of the things I, and I'm, i won't because there are some questions i'll wrap it up because donald has spoken so eloquently one of the things i would say is it was very clear to me and conscientious objectors themselves told me that everybody was treated more fairly than they had been in the first world war the government had learned its lesson it learned the men were prepared prepared they didn't actually have to they faced the threat of going in front of a firing squad rather than relinquish their stand and they learned however and, and I mean, con I think conscientious objectors, the work they did in humanitarian work was absolutely phenomenal. There were some organizers, some initiatives that were set up that sort of laid the basis for social work subsequently. But having said that everybody was treated more fairly, there were um, examples of appalling brutality most particularly for non-combatants who refused military to to obey order you know they wouldn't they refused orders and most particularly at a place called dingledale which i'm sure donald will have heard about which was at, near liverpool where large numbers of conscientious objectors were treated just as badly as co's in the first world war they were beaten they were stripped they had cold water thrown on them they were kept in solitary confinement um i mean not the numbers equivalent to the absolutists in the first world war but nevertheless and another place where there really was brutality was ilfracombe training camp near devon and the conditions were absolutely shocking they did hit the press letters were smuggled out by CEOs and friends of CEOs that found their way to the cbco and questions were asked in the house of commons it was nothing it was the extent was not as bad but the treatment was every bit as brutal for some of the men who refused to put on their uniforms and who refused and i know because just to conclude i did a book launch for my book and I did, I sort of lost my nerve and I wrote to Bruce Kent and asked if he would speak at my launch and I sent him a copy of my book and I had a very, very nice email back from him and he was far too busy to come to Hastings, that's fair enough, I really had to do it myself, but he did say that he thought everything had happened in the First World War he did not realize and i think he was quite genuine he did not realize there was so much to say and that the story was so big really big i believe it's a much neglected story it needs much more coverage it was a very different war one conscientious objector i spoke to said and i don't know if donald would agree or disagree that it was almost People were more lenient and kinder and more understanding to countries in the Second World War. But the decision not to fight in the face of fascism and Nazism was a very hard one for decent people who cared just as much about the horrors of what was going on in Germany and Italy and elsewhere and in occupied territories as anybody else. It, my sense when I finished, was that it presented a different test of conscience it, it for some people some of the people i spoke to and some of the diaries i read they they knew they couldn't kill they knew, that was out of the question and it's probably why there were also there were so many more alternativists in the second world war there weren't as many absolutists uh, proportionately look i'll stop there um because actually we could still be here tomorrow morning.